We are going to continue with variables today. We're gonna to look at some more types. So far, we've just seen two types. Can anyone tell me what one of those is? I guess three technically, but yeah. Integer, int, yes, good. It's another one, string, string. There is one more, if anyone wants to say it. Scanner, yeah, scanner is the third type that we've looked at. But int and string are the only ones we've really studied how they work and what you can do with them. Today, we're gonna look at a couple more. But first, we're gonna look at new operations you can do with them. Up till now, we've kind of just assigned to the integers and used them. Now, we're going to do things where we change them, adjust the values that are stored in them in more interesting ways. So this is, uh, instead of saying the cost of textbook equals 250, then equals 200, then equals 300, we can adjust the price relative to itself. So when I stressed earlier, this equals, was not compares equal to. It's the assignment, like take what's on the right and store it in what's on the left. That matters because if this were like a mathematical equals, this second line wouldn't make any sense. What I'm saying here is to raise the price by 50. So what's here is gonna evaluate to whatever's in it currently. And we hit this line, so this will be 250. And then we'll add 50 to that. And then over here, we store 300. And we come down here, we do the same thing again. This will be 300 at this point. So 300 plus 50, and then we store 350. And then if we print that out, we'll see that it prints 300. And I can run this code to see it. So we have our first line here that sets this variable to 250. And here we print it out. So this is gonna print, this is the 250 that's getting printed out over here. So to take our box analogy, we have this box. And the box is called cost of textbook. First line creates it and then puts a 250 in it. Then the second line is the print, so it goes cost of textbook, comes over here, sees that box, looks at what's inside the box, has a 250, 250 gets printed out. Then we come down to line seven, because line six is a comment, so we don't do anything. Line seven, cost of textbook equals cost of textbook plus 50. So first it does this calculation. Cost of textbook plus 50. And to do this calculation, it has to look and see what's in this box. So it goes to the box, it sees there's a 250 there. So right up here, we get 250, 250 plus 50, 300. And now we're done with what's on the right side. So that whole thing has been evaluated. And then the equals takes the 300 and it stores it in the cost of textbook box. So it comes down and replaces that 250. And it comes down to line 11 and we do the same thing again. Cost of textbook plus 50. What is this gonna be evaluated to? At this point in the code, we're on line 11 right now. Do this calculation here on line 11. What is the value of cost of textbook? 300. It's 300, right. Good. So then we have 300, value is 350. Then the equals stores it in that same variable. So this goes from 300 to 350, and then we print it out again. So that's that last 350 here that gets printed out. So you can use these variables in terms of themselves, and you don't have to just put straight values into them. We've already seen a bit of using variables to calculate the value of other variables. So likewise, we can do subtraction. This is the same, except I replace the additions with subtraction. So it goes 250, comes down here. Cost of textbook here is 250, minus 50 is 200 stores 200 over here. Whatever operations you want, you can multiply by two, you can divide it, you can do modulus here. Yes, there's a order of evaluation. The language specifies what gets evaluated in what order. So when there's an equals on the line, everything to the right of the equals, this code executes or is evaluated first. Before it even looks at this, it does everything over here. Then it assigns to here. So you can't have something where like it does this first and then it comes over here and assigns to it. It's always gonna do this first, evaluate what's over here, and then do that assignment or that storing operation. Because this kind of operation is so, so, so common, there is actually a shorthand for it. This operator right here, the plus equals, read this line as cost of textbook plus equals 50, and it is nearly semantically equivalent to this code. So doing cost of textbook equals cost of textbook plus 50 is the same as doing cost of textbook plus equals 50. These operators will help you out a lot. Increasing variables decreasing them or like doubling them or whatever. Remember this, you don't wanna repeat things you don't have to. So writing the variable on the left, writing it again on the right is a repetition you can just avoid. So these are the operators that use most frequently, plus equals, minus equals, and times equals. So if you wanna double something, you can write cost of textbook times equals two. But there are other ones, like you can do divided by equal, like slash equals and percent equals, but I, honestly, I have almost never use anything other than these three. Um, and these are called compound assignment operators. I can run this in REPL if we wanna see it. So the same app from the first program. All right, so I have exercise 3.1 for you. You're gonna read some numbers. Maybe it's a little more exercise with scanner using these operators. Okay, so we already have our numbers right from the user. In these things, what I'm saying, if the user enters 70 and two, what I'm seeing a lot of people doing is trying to put those numbers 70 and two into their code. It's just an example. In the homeworks, so I'll try to be more explicit and give like two examples so it can be clear that it's not just 70 and two. It could be anything. It can be three and 50. It could be two and a thousand. 
whatever. So what do we need to calculate? If the user says, I have like four paychecks and they're $100 each, then they're depositing $400. So whatever the things they enter is, is multiplying them together. We're not just doing that with numbers though, we're doing that with the variables that store the values that they gave us. And what are those variables? It's not 70 and two. What is the name of these things? Like if I wanted to say, how would you calculate this no matter what they give you? How do you express that generically without using numbers? It's the number of paychecks they have times the amount of each one. Or yes, paycheck count times paycheck amount. Like with the textbooks, how many textbooks do you want to buy? It's textbook count times textbook cost or cost of textbook. Textbook count times cost of textbook. And that's your total. Whatever values I have stored in those variables or whatever they're set to, I can change that and that formula is still true. The paycheck amount times the paycheck count is the size of their deposit. If I print this out here, I'm gonna comment this last line out for a second. How much is your paycheck? I say it's $90. How many do I have? I have six of them, 540. 90 times six. But that's not the new balance. The new balance is whatever the balance was before plus this deposit that we're making. So we're gonna take our bank account balance and we're gonna update it. So the new balance is equal to the old balance plus whatever we're depositing now. So if our old balance was 400, 400 plus 90 times six, there can be, yeah, you can write this, that's fine. There's, you don't have to because multiplication has a higher precedence than addition, so it'll do the multiplication first. There's nothing wrong with that, no reason not to do it. Remember, it will evaluate the things from left to right, but only if they have matching precedence. So if it was like A plus B plus C, it'll do A plus B first. But if it's A plus B times C, it'll do B times C first. So I can run this now. I can say a $25 paycheck, and I have three of them, it's gonna, do 25 times three here, or those are the values we got from the user, then it's going to add that to whatever the bank account balance was initially, which is 400 in this case. It's gonna store that back in bank account balance. The shorthand for this, remember, is we can just say plus equals here instead. If I comment this out, this line here, bank account balance plus equals, we can take out the other side. So these two lines do the same thing. This one I have a comment so it doesn't actually run. This line here is what I was looking for. Take the balance and increase it by whatever the size of this deposit is. Another thing to remember is we don't write int here because we're not creating a new variable. We're just updating an existing one. If you wanted to keep track of what the balance was before and you wanted to print something like your balance was, this deposit is this, your new total is this, then yeah, you would need to store it in another variable because once you update the balance, the old one is just gone. On these things, no, there's no like history stored internally in these variables. And with something like a bank account, an actual bank account, you usually would want like a transaction history. So when someone looks and sees their balance is unexpected, you can go, you're gonna want some balance variable that sits at the bottom with like the current amount in it anyway. So I already talked about how int can be negative. And I also talked about how I was really bad at math class. My calculus grade, negative 20. They can also go negative as a result of operations. If I have a $30 bank account balance and I withdraw 50, what's my balance? Yeah, negative 20. So this is gonna print out negative 20. We also are going to look at a new type today. So this new type is the double. More widely, anything that's like 3.1, one point, anything, anything, point, anything. We refer to them as floating points or floats. Double is short for double precision float. You might see float variables elsewhere. They're just more limited doubles. Um, but what I really just want you to take from that is if you want to express decimal numbers, use doubles. If I say float, I'm talking about this idea of a double. So this will print out 3.1. We talked about integer division and how it'll drop remainders. And that is not super useful for a lot of things. If you have your homework grades and you want to check what your average is, you can add the three together and divide by three, get your average. But if you do those with ints, you're going to lose the remainder. And I don't think you guys would like if I lost the remainders on all your grades. Let me open this in REPL and we can see this guy run 90, 85, and 100. On this line here, I add the three of them together and then I divide by three and I store that in a variable called average. And then I print out the average 91.6666 and that's the homework grade, which I would round up to a 92. But if I did it with ints, you would get a 91. Notice that this three here is not a three point anything. So it is an int itself. If you divide an int by an int, the result is an int. But if you divide a double by an int, the result is a double. So if you divide a double by an int, the result is a double. But the question was, I think if I do this, average will be 91.0 because this thing on the right will be evaluated first. They'll do that whole calculation, which is just gonna divide an int by an int and then store the result in the double. If the calculation is still done with ints, then yeah, the result will be an int and then it gets promoted to double. So here's an example program. We are just gonna calculate simple like miles per hour. So we ask the user how far they went. They enter their distance in miles, 6.5 miles. And then how long did it take in hours? And then it'll print out their speed accurately instead of just taking an integer and dropping the remainder. We read in miles from the user, we read in 
hours from the user. They're both variables now. We calculate the speed based on that. So whatever the user can, enters in, we react to that. We're dynamic. We're not fixed on value. And then double speed equals, you just do the division, miles per hour, and then print it out. So open that one up, create our scanner, print out how far did you go in miles. Then read in next double. So this is a new thing here. Read in next double from the user. How long did it take you? Read in an, another double from the user. Do our calculation, divide miles by hours, print out the result. So I went 6.5 miles and it took me 2.1 miles. So 3 point blah, 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 miles per hour. And that's our result. Uh, we can read three things from the user now. What are those three types that we know how to read? Scanner is what we use to read, but what are the things we can get from the user? Like if I read the name, what would the type of that be? String, right? And how do we get the string? Exactly. Okay, so we have string, keyboard, dead, next line. Someone else raise their hand, tell me what's another type and how we get it. Int. That's the other type we get. How do we get that from the user? Keyboard's at next int. Good. And now we have one more that we know how to read from the user. What did we just learn? Double and how do we get that? Keyboard's at next double. Good. Exercise 3.2. Uh, quick example of how to use pi here. If I did system.out.printline math.py, that'll just print out pi. I'm not saying your code should have this line in it. I'm just showing you this is how you get this value in your code. So instead of pi, like the character pi, you're gonna type math.pi. So the first thing I wanna do here is read in the radius from the user. We need a variable that holds whatever the user enters. It's gonna be of type double, double radius. We know how to read a double from the user. It's keyboard.next double. So now if I were to print out radius and just type like, 9.2, your radius 9.2. That's not what we really want, right? We're not trying to print the radius, we're trying to print the area. So how do we calculate the area? Well, the area is just the radius times the radius times math.py. We're gonna store that in another thing called, called area so we can keep track of what this is. And then we're gonna print out the area right here. All right, so we have our line five, which creates a scanner. So I'm just gonna label this keyboard as just a thing that exists in our code the keyboard, the scanner that lets us read from the user. Line six is gonna print out, enter the radius of your circle. Line seven is gonna wait for the user to type a double and then hit enter. So it creates this box called radius. So it creates a box called radius. Then from the keyboard, we say, give us the next double the user enters. So whatever the user enters, that's what's gonna be stored in this box. So in this example down here, I typed 7.3 and then I hit enter. So when I said, keyboard, give me your next double, the keyboard gave me 7.3 and I shoved that in the radius box. Now that I have that stored in the radius box, I can compute the area, say radius times radius times math.py. On each of these times it sees radius, it's gonna look in that box, see a 7.3, then it's gonna look again, it's gonna see 7.3, then math.py, that's a variable set by Java somewhere. It's gonna multiply by that and then just print out whatever area was calculated at. The last new type we're gonna look at today, char is a single character. It's as simple as that. You use single quotes, like apostrophes around it instead of saying double quotes. If you put double quotes around it, it's a string. If you put single quotes, it's a char, a single character. A string is actually internally a sequence of chars. Some people read this as char because it's short for character. So they work well with strings. They play together well. So down here I have a string word banan and then an A, and I can do the plus operation with a string and a char, and it'll just add that char to the end of it, so this whole thing will print banana. They don't work as intuitively with each other, so here's my char A, and I'm gonna add another char to it. Who's, uh, who's got an idea of what happens here, or at least what do you think should happen here on the second line when I have a single char and I try to add another char to it? Replace it, okay. It'll turn it into a string, okay. All right, so we have capital A plus the character one, not the integer one. Let's see what happens when we run this. The result is a lowercase r. I like how confused you all look right now because I'm glad you're paying attention. This prints lowercase r. Let's try something else. Let's say I say char letter equals capital C and then I subtract one from it. The integer one, not the character one this time. What should this print? Capital B, okay, lowercase c. All right, let's run it and find out. It is capital B. And if I do this twice, what do I expect to see? Capital A, that's what I get. And if I do this three times, what do I expect to see? Oh wait, that's an at sign. A question mark, five times, a greater than, ASCII. Each one of these characters actually has an integer value associated with it. So this is called ASCII, A-S-C-I-I. Uh, pronounced ASCII. If you Google ASCII table, you'll see all this. But there's only a few of these I actually know for any reason. Um, just to be aware this is what's happening. So when I say C minus equals one, it goes from 67 to 66, which is the value for B, and then to A, and then to 64, 
which is the add sign, and then to 63, which is a question mark, 62, which is greater than. When I did that first example, A plus the character 1, it was 65 plus the character 1, which is 49. We add those together, and we get 114, which is lowercase r, of just more string operations. You can also do plus equals the strings to append, stick another string on the end of it. So here, it's another like hello world example. This line creates a string called greeting. Inside of it, I put the text hello. So we have a greeting box. Inside of that, I have hello, comma. I print out the user, what's your name? Read in the name from the user. Then here I do greeting plus equals name or greeting equals greeting plus name, same thing. So that's gonna append the user's name. So whatever they typed in at the end of this string. So you've seen like inside of the print, system.out.println, adding two strings together to get something else to print. The result is another string. Now we can just modify an existing one. You can do this a little bit shorter by getting rid of that name variable by just doing greeting plus equals keyboard.next line. Just a way to update your variables. Uh, we have this thing dot length where we can just print out the number of characters stored in a string. So I can run this guy. Some really long name has 21 letters. Remember that you need an open close parentheses here to make this work. Every space in there as well. Every character in this string. A space is a character. It is 32, this character. So we have a string and we call dot length on it. Gives us the number of characters there. Something that is gonna look really weird is these backslash ends here. So this is how we put a line break inside of a string or say new line. So up till now, every time we've wanted a new line, we've had multiple system.out.println, line, system.out.println, line, system.out.println. Line. But if you want to put a new line right in the middle of something, you can just write backslash n. That's how you write that character because you can't type in a new line. We refer to this backslash n as a new line. So here I have one backslash n word backslash n per backslash n line. Then we get one word per line. So each one of these gets printed on its own line. Set of spaces in between them. You can also do it like this, where you just have a new line for some of them. You can just have one at the end there. So special characters when you want to put them into your text. Backslash and then something. So what if I wanted to print out this text? I just want to write a program that's one system.out.print line and it says, we are learning, quotes, escape sequences today. If I come into REPL, say I just copy it straight from the slide. We are learning escape sequences today. Well, this needs to go in quotes first. But this isn't going to work because there's already a set of quotes, right? So this quote here matches this quote here. We use another escape sequence. So backslash quote is what you use when you want to put a quotation mark inside of a string. So instead of it being read as a special character that says this is where the string ends, it just sees it as a quote character. So now if I run this, I'll get we are learning escape sequences today. Backslash T, I forgot to highlight these in blue, but backslash T is for tabs. Tab characters can be used to align text nicely. This is something that's going to print out your homework and then your grades. So it's going to be like homework one, you got this, homework you got this. Um, for example, I've just sampled like homework 1, 12, and 203. If I use spaces, it's going to look kind of ugly because you're going to have a 1 and then a space and then a grade and then like a 12 and then a space and then a grade. So the grades are going to kind of be on an angle. One those be in line nicely. So you all like the homework numbers and then all the grades and they look like columns. You can align these if you use a tab instead of a space character. So we have everything aligned nicely to this first column here because the tab followed by this is just going to go up to that next tab point. You can use this to format our output nicely. It's not foolproof. If you had a homework number that was like this wide, like all the way out to here, then a tab would go to like the next stop. These are the ones you should know about. Like there's, there's a bunch of them. So we have the tab character. We have a new line or like a line break. We have for a literal quotation mark inside of a string, slash quote, single quote. This is for if you want like a char to be equal to a single quote. That's wrong. Char quote equals a quote and then a single quote. So this is like setting quote equal to the one quote character. It's like a string. If you want it, you would have a double quote and then whatever with the backslash quote inside of it. So if instead of like quote a quote, it's quote backslash quote quote. Not something you need super often, but it's nowhere that exists. If you actually want to put a backslash into a string, you need to use two backslashes. That's how you escape the backslash itself. Talk about escape sequences instead of escaping the backslash. That's what that would be referred to as. We have exercise 3.3. So just work on that for the next couple minutes. Doing some string operations and using these backslashes.